The Moscow mayor saying that the situation is difficult and that a counter-terrorism regime has been declared in the capital and there are also roadblocks being built outside Moscow. So to discuss, I'm joined by former UK ambassador to Russia, Sir Tony Brenton. Um, Tony, talk to me about this then, because now it feels like something is definitely afoot and the people themselves are now concerned about what, what's, what's happening. Yeah, no, something is, as you put it, definitely afoot. And this is a genuine threat to, to Putin's survival as, as president. I mean, partly the whole situation is Putin's fault. He set Prigozhin up uh, in a way as a, as a challenger to the normal security and army authorities in Russia, who didn't perform very well at the beginning of the Ukrainian war, to jog them into being more effective, which to some extent they've done. Uh, but the Wagner mercenary group, which um, uh, Prigozhin leads, has suffered in those in those battles it's been the most successful actually military performer uh, in the last in the last few months but Prigozhin has become noisier and noisier and angrier and angrier with the underperformance of the normal military authorities to the point where he's become he's become very publicly critical of them to some extent publicly critical of Putin himself and Putin has decided literally today that he needs to be stopped and shut up Prigozhin's response has been in effect to lead what Putin himself describes as an act of treachery, a mutiny, and his forces are now marching on Moscow. Now, he's not got that many forces. He's got perhaps 10 or 20,000 men, but they are battle hardened. They have been effective, as I've said, against in, in, in Ukraine. Prigozhin himself has a lot of um, resonance at least in uh, right-wing circles in, in Russia. So there will be people who will be wishing him well in this project. I frankly suspect he's not going to make it, and there are already stories of him being attacked. But this is could be the beginning of, 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 of civil war in Russia and indeed of Putin's fall. Mm, because, um, I mean, I think Putin, in my view, probably thought that this should stay just on Ukrainian soil, which is why, you know, we, he was very, you know, very on it when NATO were trying to negotiate with him. Do you think that now perhaps... Um, Prigozhin might actually be able to amass more support, especially as the troops are probably getting a bit disenfranchised by this whole war. Apparently some of them paying for their own equipment and a lot of them are going hungry, a lot of mothers losing their sons. Is there not an energy now that's heading towards people getting fed up with the war? Well, I, no, that's not the case. The, the, actually, the Russian people, this is something which we Brits find very hard to believe, but is the case. The Russian people are solidly behind the war. Russia is a country which, when it feels itself to be under external pressure, gathers in solidarity around its president, around its state, and that's exactly what we've seen in the context of this war. But you are right that um, Prigozhin does have a lot of national credibility, and I assume he's relying on that as his troops approach Moscow to generate an irresistible political force which will back up his demands for the sacking of the current leadership of the Russian military and will put Prigozhin in a much more powerful position. My guess, as I've said, is that this will not succeed, but we will have to see over the next few hours, which is an absolutely crucial moment. Because mm. it does feel this is the first time that Vladimir Putin has actually been challenged or that anything has come out from Russia that will suggest that some people are not happy with the war. But then there is that other worry that Prigozhin might actually be a lot worse than Putin, because as you pointed out, he's yeah. quite far right, he's quite right wing. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, lots of people have talked cheerfully. I mean, I've been talking to British Western correspondents who have been predicting the disappearance of Putin for the last decade at least, and they've so far been wrong, which is another reason for doubting that they're right this time. But I've also been pointing out, and other people have been pointing out, that if Putin goes, you're not going to get a cuddly liberal as a successor. You're going to get pretty much a clone. You're going to get a tough, possibly from the security services, possibly from the military, possibly from the nationalized industries, but you're going to get a tough nationalist in the Putin mold. And if you get Prigozhin, you're actually getting a guy who is much tougher and much more aggressive in how Russia should be conducting its war in Ukraine, who has talked about actively about the use of nuclear weapons, for example, in a way that Putin has been much more restrained about. So be very careful what you wish for here. Well, what about uh, the fact that the, the Moscow mayor says that the situation is difficult and that a counter-terrorism regime has been declared in the Russian capital? That sounds quite serious. It looks to me as if they're putting up the barricades, they're, they're getting the air force in, there are stories already of attacks on Prigozhin's column. 
there's going to be, it feels to me, some quite significant fighting over the next few hours, which will settle the fate of Russia's government for the foreseeable future. Mm. And, but, but also, Denis Manturov, who's the deputy prime minister, has apparently left Moscow. He, he's also got out there. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know about Denis Manturov, but um, I, I do say this. The, the Russian political elite at the moment, the people around Putin, are almost certain to back him very firmly, because if he goes, they almost certainly go very quickly mm. thereafter. So the, the defence minister, the head of the armed forces, the heads of the security services, all of them know very well that they have to give total backing to Putin. They have to ensure that Putin survives because their survival depends upon his. And that's one quite strong reason for believing that he will actually win out in this trial of force, which is now, now taking place. Do you ever see a situation where the West might actually slightly not get behind Putin in his war, but try and keep him there? Because actually what could come would be worse. Because you know how no, I don't West seem to have apparently put in soft people, like apparently people say that um, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was like a mouthpiece, a puppet for the West so that we would get things done and things like that. I think we will be very careful to not to get too deeply involved, mm. precisely because the uncertainty is in it. And if we end up, I mean, this is a really um, appalling prospect, but it could happen. If we end up with a real civil war going on in Russia, with parts of the country armed and fighting other parts, you're looking at a major nuclear power falling apart with all sorts of the dangers of loose nukes, whatever happens. And that's a direct threat, massive, massive threat to civilian life all across the continent. We don't want that to happen. We want Russia, even with Putin, to remain a stable, relatively controlled country. Um, our interest is that the Russians themselves sort out this um, uh, this, this um, confrontation of force quickly, hopefully without too much bloodshed, and then we deal with whatever emerges from it in ways which are consistent with what we've been wanting from them all along, which is to see them defeated in Ukraine, to see them become a much less threatening European country than they have been over the last few years. Because mm. we don't want a situation like the Gaddafi situation where you go over there, you cut off the head and then about a thousand different heads appear and then you're in a situation where you're dealing with terrorist groups like ISIS and all these offshoots that seem to have come from the anger of the war, which is potentially what we could wind up with. Where, where do you see this? What do you see playing out in your mind as to what's happening now? Well, where, where do you think it will go? Well, firstly, let me congratulate you. The, the Libya example is a very good example of what must not happen. We went into Libya confident that we were helping make the place better and left anarchy behind us and a very dangerous, unpleasant situation from which the country still hasn't recovered. We certainly do not want to do that in Russia for the reasons which you've described and I've described. So we, we are careful. We sit back. There are people who will be tempted to interfere. Ukraine, most obviously. And they will need to be contained. They've got their own concerns. They've got their own war to win. We're keen that they win that war, but not in a way which leaves us with a deeply destructive, unpredictable Russia on our doorstep. So this is going to require a certain amount of care. You ask me what I predict is going to happen, and I repeat what I've already said. My guess is that Putin, with a reasonably solid elite around him, with a reasonably now effective set of armed forces and security agencies, will probably defeat Prigozhin, will re-establish his authority. But obviously, he emerges from this weakened simply by virtue of the fact that he's let things reach the state that they've now reached. Mm. And that, further down the track, hopefully raises the possibility of some more manageable, sensible opposition emerging and finally seeing him off. So, Tony Brenton, thank you very much for joining me. He's the former UK ambassador to Russia. Good to talk to you. Thank you for your thoughts.